Hello everybody, uh, I'm Chad Jennings, I'm the pastor of St. Luke United Methodist Church. I'm here again with Joel Mills. Hey Joel, how's it going? Good, good. We're nice evening. Yeah. Uh, we're continuing our conversations on the big questions uh, in, uh, in the faith. And, uh, and tonight we've got a good one for you. Um, but before we get started, Joel, um, so you're a safety officer at the co-op yep. um, here in town, right? Yep, correct. Yep. Yeah. So, so what do you do as a safety officer? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, here in town, we have Renewable Energy Group's uh, biodiesel facility. Uh, and what we do there is on a very industrial commercial scale is we recycle uh, waste products that would otherwise, you know, 15, 20 years ago, just simply go into a landfill. Um, some of which could go into animal feed, not very well. Um, so we actually utilize those waste products from all your major uh, slaughterhouses and all your major uh, restaurant chains. Um, any used cooking oil, any uh, waste animal product that cannot be consumed uh, quite easily by other animals uh, without some additional processing. Um, so we can take that and buy that, right, now that there's a market for it, and, and we can consume that and make biodiesel from it, and then our biodiesel is sold off to any major truck stop, any major fueling station, you know, pick out the gas station in your mind, and if they have diesel at the pump, uh, our biodiesel is blended with their petroleum-based diesel. Um, so that, so as a safety officer at a biodiesel facility, um, it's kind of a little bit of everything. It's uh, like today, for instance, I was out in the plant. Uh, we call it a plant. It's the, the buildings, the facility, the piping, the equipment. Um, so I was out in the plant quite a bit today, uh, as well as outside in uh, what we call our tank farm, and that's where we store both our, our finished product and, and our feed stocks. Uh, those are those used cooking oils and fats, oils and greases. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a number of monthly checks, uh, weekly checks. Uh, sometimes it's an annual thing that I've got to do. Uh, there's a lot of regulations, um, most of which the regulations that we follow, that I follow, were kind of originally derived from our, our petrochem industry. Um, and, uh, and so we kind of follow, follow the petrochem standards, if you will, on behalf of uh, our nation's environmental protection agency, as well as um, OSHA standards and that sort of thing. So, so these, these regulations that you have to follow, do they come to you in some sort of manual in the book? Yeah, great question. Um, so not necessarily, but rather um, there's, there's actually, you know, on the onset uh, with our legal department and, um, and our folks in our world headquarters in Ames, Iowa, there's a lot of uh, really alliances. Um, you know, I think all too often, um, unfortunately, we kind of look at government as big brother or this or that when really it's just it's it's our fellow citizens that work for our government and utilize our tax dollars to keep everybody accounted for and playing by the same set of rules so, so, so it's do actually you, do you then with other plants that have a similar kind of structure do you uh talk about best practices you absolutely share those best practices absolutely and and, and then you pass around sure uh, what works for you what doesn't work for you so that you can learn from each other yep wholeheartedly and 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 really those are derived from um you know first off uh the i'm gonna say like the oldest industry businesses if you will uh which again are are some of the you know uh, big oil players in the game for us um because they're the ones that quite literally kind of helped mold and helped create a lot of these standards that we all play by the same set of rules and um and those rules are regulations um and uh and laws created by our federal government or our state and local governments um so there's best practices you know on the onset it's shared from you know this is what we want you to do and this is how we want you to do it and here's how to get there and then once you learn from that uh, and that entity or that governing body, if you will, then absolutely you can share those best practices uh, facility to facility. Um, I've got some, some people in the same position that I'm in, um, kind of all over the state of Iowa, as well as some of the neighboring states, and uh, been fortunate enough to travel in this, in this role, in this capacity. Went down to Louisiana two years ago, uh, went out to uh, Washington um, just last summer, about this time last summer. Um, so there's absolutely learning opportunities um, from you know, individuals that are in my role at their facilities 
Uh, and some of the regulations are a little bit different, um, but it's all, you know, it's all very similar. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, the, the question that we um, were going to bring up tonight mm -hmm. is about how the Bible was put together and uh, what the Bible uh, purpose is okay. for the, the Christian faith. But, sure. but really, we can't, also, we can't talk about it without also talking about the Jewish faith as well. Sure. Yep. Because they use the First Testament yep. um, of, of our scriptures. And so, uh, would it surprise you if I told you that the Bible was put together in much the same way as your best practices were, are for your job? It, yeah, it would a little bit, but I suppose the more I think about it, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so the the Bible is referred to as the canon. Okay. And the, the canon um, is actually a, a Greek word that um, refers to a rule or a set of standards uh, by which you would... Um, you would live your life or you live out your faith. Okay. Okay, and so it's known as the canon. And uh, while there are lots of good uh, religious books out there that provide your life, uh, these are the ones that were put together as, as kind of the standard. Okay. The rule, if sure. you will, yep. right? Yeah. And so it's kind of the rule that you would live by or the set of regulations. Gotcha. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that everything that's in Scripture is an absolute rule we get okay. to follow. There are several scriptures that if you were to look them up, um, you'd be surprised that they're in there because we just wouldn't follow them now. Right. Um, you know, rules that were made for a specific time and place mm -hmm. that uh, were, were vital then. Okay. Uh, for instance, um, we're really big on washing hands right now mm -hmm. because of this uh, COVID stuff. Yes. Um, but... They wash their hands in a very specific way, from the tip of the finger all the way to the elbow, because they wanted to make sure that whatever they would eat would not have anything that would make them sick, hmm. much the way that we do that now. But we know that it's not necessary to wash all the way to the elbow. Correct. Um, for them, they may not have understood that, and so the, the way that they wash their hands is really important. And they would actually wash their hands multiple times to make sure that the yeah. water they were using didn't have running water. No. Right? No. So the water they were using was clean hmm. by the time they were done. So they might wash their hands, dump out the water, wash their hands again. Wow. Right? And so they really yeah. wanted to make sure. And so, you know, we have learned now that we don't have to really worry about that. Right. Right? Right, right. The prohibitions against pork was mm -hmm. because if you didn't cook pork properly, yeah. Right? Yeah. And of course, now we understand how to cook pork. And mm -hmm. uh, how, I can't understand how you, anybody could live without bacon, so that's a good thing. You right? gotta have bacon. Right. So, <laughs> so there are things in there that, um, that we have seen or were important at the time, but may not be as important now. Okay. But there are other things that are certainly just as important now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the struggle for us sometimes is to figure out which of those we really do need to follow sure. and which ones we don't. Sure. So the the Bible was put together um, over the course of hundreds of years, okay? Really thousands of years. About when did that begin, though? So we're not really sure when the earliest parts are. Now they have, like scholars have figured out that probably the oldest piece of known scripture is a section in the book of Ruth. Uh, a section of poetry in the book of Ruth that became part of that book, um, but was has uh, indicators in it from way, way, way back. Really? Right? But traditionally, um, Jews understand that the first five books of the Bible were all written by Moses. Now, the likelihood that they were actually all written down by Moses is probably pretty low. Yeah. And, you know, it was common during that time to lay um, authorship as a way of honoring somebody who was really important. And Moses was the big dog in the faith. Yeah. All right. right. Moses led the people out of Egypt in the Exodus mm -hmm. and formed them in a covenant relationship with God. And so he was really the one who started it all. Sure. And so, yeah, it would make sense that that would be the case. 
but, but traditionally, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are known as the Torah, or the law, Okay. Um, were, are authored by Moses. Hmm. Okay. The rest of the book have different purposes. Um, there are uh, history books. There are uh, major prophets. Mm -hmm. They're probably the prophets that you would be able to name. If I said name a prophet, you might name one. Uh, oh, put me on the spot. Well, I won't make you answer. So, um, okay. you probably have heard of Isaiah. Yep. Where you know, talk about uh, Jesus way yep. back when. Um, the prophet Jeremiah, yep. the prophet Ezekiel. Okay. Okay. So, those were the major prophets, the big ones. Okay. But then there were also some minor prophets. Right. And, and minor just means that they weren't quite as... As well known. Yeah. Right. right, right. Okay. And so there, there's that. And then there's uh, books of poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, the Psalms would be included in there. Yep. Um, and then also the wisdom books like Proverbs. And sure. Ecclesiastes. Sure. Okay. So they serve a different purpose. And and the way that, um, that Jews use those as a standard is the Torah... The first five books are like definitive, for sure. okay. and the others are informing what the Torah says. So you can't read any of the others without the lens of the Torah. Interesting. Okay. Now, okay. It, maybe it'd be easier to understand um, if we looked at it from the viewpoint of the New Testament. Okay. In the same way, the gospel in the New Testament, mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yep, yep, yep. Right, they tell us like the story of Jesus, and they are the primary um, ways that we learn about what Jesus taught and, and how Jesus was um, was without the faith. Okay. And then the the rest of the New Testament is besides Acts um, are all like letters. That were written by various apostles right. um, in the in the church, various people who were really prominent teachers. Mostly it was Paul, though. A wasn't lot it? of it was Paul. Well, I mean, there, there were some others. There, sure. Peter sure. has a, a few in there. Okay. James has one. So, oh, that's right. right. Yep. A lot of them are named uh, after the person that wrote them or the people they were written. Okay. So the Book of Romans yep. was written to the to the Christian church in Rome. Mm -hmm by Paul. Yep. Okay. So those, those those letters. And then there's this book at the end called Revelation, which is known as an apocalyptic piece of literature. Okay. And so it serves a different purpose. And who authored that? So um, John is the is the author that said in the beginning. Okay. Um, that authored that. Okay. Hmm. That would not be John the Baptist, but it would be sure. John that um, that walked with Jesus. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Um, although there's some question about whether it was really that. Interesting. And, and so the, the authorship is not as important there as, like, who the, mm -hmm. the community was that it was being written to. Okay. So the letters, Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, all of those, mm -hmm. cannot really be read without putting it up against what the gospel is. And so the way that the Torah, or the law, yep. um, informs all the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, mm -hmm. the Gospels inform all the rest of the New Testament scriptures. Okay. They, they do not uh, stand alone. Sure. You know, you can read the Gospels and you can learn how to live, but it's really hard to read the letters without also going back to see what they were talking about. Right, right. All right. So, um... The, the Old Testament, of course, was written first mm -hmm. um, and became a canon first. And um, it, the, it, it actually didn't become like set the way it is now until sometime the process for that was between 200 uh, BC or BCE yep. and then to 200 AD. Okay. So in that 400 year period, and some scholars think that maybe they began that process to really do that in 400 BCE. Hmm. Um, so it might have taken a little longer. Sure. But that was when the rise of uh, rabbinical Judaism or rabbis, um, the, the group of rabbis that would have studied this and would put it together, were sifting through all of the sacred scrolls to figure gotcha. out which ones were really, really important. 
So it took, it took them a while. Yeah, and, right. and we know that by the time, like the end date of that, really, for that rabbinical part was in 70, uh, when the Jewish temple was destroyed. Okay. In the year 70. That's after Christ died, yep. right? Yep. And, uh, uh, but it continued on for a little while after that. And so that was put together that way. Now, those scriptures were actually being used um, in much the same way for centuries before that. And um, uh, one of the things that, like, one of the things that we know is that um, the scriptures weren't really written down in the form that would happen now until after they were exiled. So an army, the Babylonian army, came in, conquered uh, the Jewish lands, conquered Israel, and scattered all of the, mm. the movers and shakers in sure. the land across the empire. To kind of split up the brain trust so there couldn't be any other yeah. ones, right? For, and one of the things they did was they destroyed culture and history mm. and documents or whatever they could to try to assimilate these folks into their own culture. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the scriptures, of course, are one of those things that they destroyed yeah. because you you also had to try to destroy anything related to uh, a nation sure. uh, or their God. Yep. Right? And so um, they they had to rewrite all of that down um, after the exile was over, and that happened in the fifth or sixth century uh, before Christ was born. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. And so the the way we the form we have them now is relatively young in the scheme of things. Yeah, I guess. So, so if these scriptures are ancient, though, you might ask the question, well, how do we know that they're accurate? Yeah, and recollected and gathered back yes. up. That's the reason that we're sitting by the fire tonight. Okay. Okay? All right. Because the way those stories were told was that, you know, the, the community would sit around the fire at night. And while they were sitting around the fire and they were having community, Correct. there was a person and really not just the person but also an apprentice mm -hmm. and the the person's job was to be the keeper of the wisdom the keeper of the stories right and so they would tell the stories that gave them their history so uh the storyteller might tell the story of creation we went through the creation stories mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago right and sure. so um they might tell like, someone might say a storyteller, tell me how the world was created. Where did we come from? Mm -hmm. and, and the storyteller would tell that story. And they would tell it the same way every time. Wow. And, and so, so much so that the people sitting around the fire, if they listened to it enough, would start to be able to say it yeah. as well. Yeah. And so in that way, they memorized these scriptures mm -hmm. um, just through the storytelling. And, and we know that, that the people who were the keepers of that story took it so seriously. They spent their entire lives learning these stories that they really could, without having it written down, sure. keep an accurate account of these right. stories. And they probably didn't have the ability to write it down anyway. Not at the beginning. Yeah, not at the beginning. Later on they did, but not no. at the beginning. Right? Sure. Because the stories predate what's known for us as paper. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they did. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's that's one of the, the ways that we know that it was accurate. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, the New Testament, um, you know, those Gospels were not written while Jesus walked the earth. The stories right. happened. Yep, exactly. And, and it's very likely that the disciples who walked the earth with Jesus were telling those stories everywhere they went mm -hmm. because they were told to go share the good news yeah. right mm -hmm. and so they would say you know they would say so what would you do of, you know like if you have a dispute with your neighbor and the disciples would say ah well jesus taught about what we should do with our neighbor jesus taught us that we should love our neighbor as ourselves sure and they might have told them the story of the good samaritan Mm -hmm. Which is what Jesus did when he talked about being a neighbor. Yeah. And so um, they would tell those stories. Well, eventually, um, people started to say, um, maybe we should write that down. Yeah. Or they might have said something like, you know, I really wish I could take this story back with me 
to my hometown. Yeah. They, you know, there were people that traveled all through the known world. Rome was a big empire, mm -hmm. and they had trade going on across the whole empire. And so people would go from trading port to trading port to trading port, yep. and they would bring the, the, the stories of the faith with them yeah. and share it as they traveled. Well, they started to ask for, um, you know, copies of the, of the story of Jesus yeah. so that they could share it wherever they went. They wanted to see the log. They did. You know. And the, the same thing happened with the letters. Yeah, so, or the so letters the, or the, the scrolls Paul's or anything. Paul's letter yeah. to the Romans, you know, might have been written to the Romans. Mm -hmm. But as as people came uh, to that port or, or to that trade center and went to a, a, a church service, sure. right, or a gathering, and they heard the letter from Paul, they went, wow, that's profound. I need to I need to take that to, back to my church. Yep. And so they would copy it. And then they would take it with them back. And so these letters circulated all around. And there were lots of letters at the beginning. Lots of them. And uh, some of them were much more popular than others. Some of them really didn't make it beyond the community for which they, they originally were written. And it was by the passing around and the general acceptance of these letters that they became so popular that they really became kind of their own standard, their own canon, yeah. um, that, that people just use. These are the, the 12 books, that, that, or the 12 letters mm -hmm. that we're going to use all the time. Yes, makes sense, yeah. So that um, kind of formed, the New Testament kind of formed by the year 400 to where it was pretty standard, but there were some communities mm -hmm. that had a scripture here, or a book here, or a book there that they might have put in, yeah. that other places didn't have. And it wasn't until the Council of Trent, which happened in 1536, I think, wow. um, that the, the Catholic Church um, convened all of the leaders of the, really? of the faith world, yeah. and, and they decided these books are in, and these books are not. Okay. And that was in 15, 1536. Okay. And then not long after that, Luther came along, Martin Luther, yeah. right? Yeah. And when Martin Luther uh, left the Catholic Church, he also rearranged the, the Bible. And he cut out some of the books that he didn't think were necessary. Okay. And these would be ones that you really haven't heard of. Interesting. Because in the Protestant faith, yeah. or those that are not Catholic, um, we might have access to those scriptures, but they aren't in our regular Bible. They're in an addendum that's called the Apocrypha, which just means extra. Oh, okay. So it's an extra book. Sure. And so, um, you know, like the first and second Ezra's, you probably haven't heard of them. No, right? never heard so of them. So there are the, the Maccabees, there are books sure. that are in there. They're interesting to read, sure. but um, they aren't part of what would be our yeah. or our Gotcha. And Martin Luther did that, what, what, what time frame was Martin Luther again? Uh, I think he was in the 1600s. Yeah, 1600s sometime. Yeah, okay. Wasn't there, what, what was in, what was in 10, or a thousand or whatever, however you say that, 10 hundred, thousand? What was, like the, the great schism or anything like that, did that have anything to do with the Bible? You know what I'm talking about? What was that when the when the Orthodox kind of broke away from? So that actually happened really earlier than that. But was it? Okay. Yeah, there might have been a more distinct but, uh, yeah. schism at that time. But, gotcha. But the Eastern Church and the yep, Western that's Church right. yep. were uh, really from the very beginning uh, kind of taking different uh, directions. Yep. But all the while. What's interesting for me is that all the while it seemed like these stories and these set of rules or this, this canon still it's just stayed consistent, kind of regardless of the faith path, if you will, or what we now call denomination. Yeah, so the, you know, the, um, the canon mm -hmm. uh, that we have now is considered a closed canon. In other words... The revelation is done, okay. and uh, you can't add to it or subtract from it. Right. But everybody back then, you know, 400 It was AD, also new. Oh, it was also new that they didn't, they, they couldn't make that determination. Right. Gotcha. Right. Okay. They, they, they probably made determinations for their community. 
Gotcha. All right. And they probably argued about um, what should be in and what should be out, but you know, until there was a definitive. Yeah. And really, the, in the early days, wow. those communities were really led by local leaders. Yep. They weren't led by one bishop. Sure. So that's, you were talking about the difference between the Eastern and the Western. Yeah. The, the Bishop of Rome was the leader of the Western Church, and the Bishop of Alexandria was the okay. leader of the Eastern Church. And so, yep. depending on who you followed, is really where you ended up. And, gotcha. and they, they kind of have different flavors, even though mm -hmm. they're both still Christian. Right. And, right. and so the same thing happens within our denominations. Um, you know, some denominations will really uh, focus only on the Gospels. Yeah. Or only on right. some letters, right? And they may even just, just pretty much disregard the First Testament. Um, although there's a lot of grace in the First Testament. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And it's the Bible Jesus used. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, there's reasons why we have it in there. And, and really as, um, especially in, for the Jews, but also for Christians, you know, there are places in the Bible that even though this is kind of our standard or our rule book, there are places that contradict each other, mm -hmm. that very clearly yeah. are in opposition to each other. Right. And, and a couple weeks ago we talked about there being two creation stories, that Correct. Genesis 1 was, a, was one story and Genesis 2 was another. Mm -hmm. And, and they were both included because it was decided that it was better for both of them to be included and for us to sort it out right. than to only go with one sure. and make it clear time. Yeah. And so, I'm going to wait for this next time. And so that's another reason why we can, we can feel like this is really um, uh, a... a, a Full, a full text, scripture text, right? Gotcha. Because think, things were rather they opted to leave them in rather than cut them out. Sure. So at what point then? You know, like on Bible study the other night, we were talking about. Um, I was reading from uh, from my mom's dad's um, Bible, which happens to be a King James version mm -hmm. Bible. So at what point did it kind of have to start? start to have the King James version, the whatever, the NIV version, and all these different iterations or versions, and kind of, so when did that happen, and then who decides? Like, what if what if you and I want to write a new version of the Bible in, in five to ten years? Can Could we do that? Or is that... So the answer is yes, but would it be accepted? Yeah, because um, it's kind of a change of the story. Yeah, well, it... it so every time you make a translation, you have to make choices about words. Okay, and, yeah. And so, you know, a word in the original language might mean two different things. Mm -hmm. and you have to decide which one that is. Sure. Okay? And and so it, um, it, it may not be a hard choice in some cases, and it might be a hard choice in other cases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been studying Ecclesiastes, and mm -hmm. so the word for vanity is the same word as wind, Yep. is the same word as meaningless and yep. so how do you convey the meaning yep. of that and what is the doing? choice that you make so um to answer your question though the the versions that that come out when they do are the best known translation at the time that they were written they, i mean the people who translate them are really working hard to make it an accurate translation from the text, the, the original text that they have. Okay. Okay. And also using the language of the time. And the reason why the wow. King James is hard for us to understand is because we don't speak the English yep. that they did the old English, when yeah. when that one was written, which was probably what 1700s yeah, or 1700s. something. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. um, so yeah, it's a different type of language. It, it's the same thing as trying to read like the. The Constitution, yeah. right? The language is different. Good point. Um, and the, even the way it's things are spelled is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so you, we have to we have to make translations. Sure. So when you get a new translation, often it's done for one of two reasons: either they discover some older version of the original text. Okay. So you know. Uh, a century ago, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
But over the last century, they've also learned how to read those and they put them together. I and know. they figured out like what they might have said and they've compared them to more modern uh, versions or, or you know what what was written later. Mm -hmm. And the thing about those is those were written so early. Yeah. So they give us a really good view at like what came in an earlier place. Sure. And so you want to go back to the best version of that that you have. And the oldest version that you have because it's probably more uh, original, yeah. or more unredacted. Yeah. And and so, um, and, and a lot of Bibles and translations will do both. They'll want to do both a modern language and they'll also want to get the best probably information they can. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, they'll create their translation. And, and there's several different ways to create a translation. So you talked about could you and I make a translation. Well, if we knew Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek and you know the languages that a lot of the scriptures came in, but um, you know Jesus spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, and so um, you know, but you'd also have to know the Greek because Paul wrote in, in Greek. Yeah. Right. And so you'd have to know all these languages. Um, so you could do the interpretation yourself with the translation yourself if you were familiar enough with the language. Yeah, which full transparency, I do not know those languages. Well, I so don't either. we have our work cut out for us. Right, I have to <laughs> look this stuff up. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So oh, wow. more often than not, you don't get a single person doing the translation. Okay. You get groups of people. Like you get somebody who's a Greek expert and they take care of the Greek. Gotcha. Part. Now, now, some translations will go so far as to take an expert in Matthew and have the Matthew expert do the translation of Matthew. Really? And then a okay. Mark expert do the translation of Mark. And then they just combine guys. And you might even get two or three Matthew experts that will work together to get the best translation. Mm. And so it's a translation by committee. Mm -hmm. And there are two different ways to do that, too. You can have an open committee. You can say, okay, all the scholars that are out there, we invite you to read this and to contribute to it and to argue your point about what this word should be and why. And it's an open committee. Okay. And a closed one is, I'm only going to ask the four people that I, that I want to be on my group. Gotcha. And, and I'll invite them to gotcha. be a part of this. It's a closed committee. So is anybody right now that you're aware of doing that on our Bible, or does that happen kind of continually throughout? It happens continually, and even like well-known translations, like the New International Version is a well-known translation, Okay. and it has gone through, uh, I think, three different major oh, okay. uh, translations. Gotcha. Up there. So that kind of answers my next question, maybe, is that like the... Like, let's say for a new Christian or somebody that's just wanting to go maybe buy a new Bible, what would be the easiest to read, common, that's probably the one that you're going to want from the shelf at the bookstore or from your favorite online store? So I have two answers to that. The first one is, is that it's really important for you to just need some text and find out which one works best oh. for you. Oh, okay. So uh, the easiest way to do that is to go on to uh, a Bible website, mm -hmm. um, like Bible Gateway, and they have hundreds of translations, and take a oh. passage that you're familiar with, you know, take the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23, okay. most. And then, people and then look at several different versions of that mm -hmm. and see which one kind of fits. Okay. And then if you narrow it down to a couple of them, then go look at, like, uh, the Christmas story mm. and see how that's done. And go look at some of your favorite scriptures in the Gospels mm. and see how that comes across and figure out which one is best for you. Sure. Now, if you ask me what I recommend, okay, um, I actually really like what's called the Common English Bible. Okay. Um, we have a, a publisher for the United Methodist Church, and that's spearheaded the... the yeah, the translation and the gathering of this, but it's really meant to be in today's common English. Oh. And the thing I like about it is the fact that um, you don't have 
as much. You, anytime the language can be inclusive, it's inclusive. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of one of their premises that they wanted to have in that, which will really help some people read the scripture and will probably put some others off. But, sure. but you know, like anytime it was to be all of humankind, it says that. Or if it's meant to be for men and women, it says that. Oh, okay. And so that's a choice they make, even though when it was written in the original, yeah. it just said men. Yeah, just right. men. Gotcha. But, so if it means men, they put men. If it means everybody, then they, they put right. it that way. That makes sense. But it's just really easy to read. Okay. And so that's probably the one I would check. It's the CED or the Common English Bible. Interesting. Well, we've probably exhausted this conversation for now. I'm yeah. sure there's more questions that we could come up with. But, yeah. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, please let us know. Yeah, please send them in to worship yeah. at stlukenewton.com. We have motorcycles out here. <laughs> so worship at, at stlukenewton.com. Um, you can also uh, be sure to support your local congregation uh, by sending your uh, checks in. Uh, to your local congregation. Um, you may also send them in to St. Luke, and you can find our physical address on our website, which is, at, again, at stlukenewton.com. Uh, Joel, thanks. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Certainly explained a few things that I've always uh, wanted to ask my pastor, and, and I appreciate it. And so uh, we'll continue to do this as long as there are questions that people write in. Yeah. And good work on the weather, so thank you. All right. <laughs> Until next time, blessings to you. Have a great week.